Welcome for this session of uh, Women in Quanta panel, and I'm really uh, happy to call back on the scene uh, or panelist or speaker of this morning, Nicole Olsman from uh, Riena Capital, Kristen Nair from Algorithmic Inc., Paulina Mazurek, uh, CEO of BIT, and Mathilde Mang from QFOX. Welcome, ladies. I know you present yourself this morning, and maybe I, I don't ask uh, you you explain again what you do, but I would like to have uh, a bit of your story, how you land in quantum, how you start your journey, why you arrive here. Um, maybe um, Nicole? Mm -hmm. Yeah, I can start. Um, so I started to study chemistry when um, I entered university and I was always interested in how things work, so I ended up in chemistry. And the next step to understand how things work was sort of to go into quantum. And um, at first there was no real um, um, pathway to go into quantum at the university I was at and I did not know about quantum chemistry at all. So um, when I first heard about it, I, I directly wanted to do a project there. And um, I sort of have this weird, what I call like science ADHS, um, that every time someone gives me uh, a project or dangles something in front of me, I always want to do it. So I ended up working in um, quantum chemistry and computation chemistry, doing all kinds of different projects from very accurate calculations of very small molecules to very big proteins and simulations. And in the end, uh, that uh, meant that um, when startups came up, doing quantum computing and, and quantum chemistry being the first um, or one of the most promising areas to um, uh, run a calculation on because you a quantum a chemical system is a quantum system and a qu quantum computer is a quantum system, so you run a quantum system on a quantum system. Um, startups were looking for quantum chemists and ideally um, if you are a startup you don't want to have five chemists from different areas but you pick one that has a broad um, um, background and in the end this is how I ended up in quantum because I had this broad background and could um, speak about the whole range of, of computational chemistry. Thank you. Kirsten? Yeah, so mine was quite unplanned actually. <laughs> I'm not a quantum physicist. I, I'm a biology, biologist by training and I spent the last 10 years in healthcare or life sciences uh, apart from a two-year stint when I was working at Tech Nation, which is a UK government's accelerator for tech uh, startups. And I knew always by, by stepping away that I needed to go back in the life sciences, but using an exponential technology uh, to, to do so. And actually I was in a few uh, late stage uh, interview sessions with, with AI for uh, drug discovery until a recruiter sort of showed me this job description. And I think it was a, a feeling of both like uh, extreme excitement but also a lot of fear because I didn't uh, understand most of what was written in, in that job description when they, they explained. And I somehow I just, I just, I just knew I needed to go there. <laughs> and, and it kind of fuels my, my uh, desire to continue, to learn, to continue learning. Um, but I also have had a, an incredible two years, and I'm extremely lucky to have a CEO, uh, Professor Mani, uh, Sabrina Maniscalco, who is, uh, takes a lot of time to explain uh, things, and I su I'm just very grateful to, for, for her and her time. Uh, and honestly, I think uh, even looking at what's been uh, going on in the field over the last two years, and even when I'm listening at, at, at the uh, current conference, I'm super excited about this field. I think it's, it has so much potential, and uh, there's just a lot uh, of exciting things going on here. So um, that's yeah. how my journey came. Paulina? Uh, yeah, so um, I have not technical background as well, and it didn't prevent me from uh, starting my career working for tech uh, international companies. So I started at Motorola, went through uh, various positions, different areas, um, and I met my first co-founder there, not knowing that he will be my first co-founder, but, uh, but we're friends. And then I moved to Google, um, where we were setting up engineering office in Poland, and I got this technical bug. I really was um, super curious on what the technology can bring to the table. And my biggest, biggest uh, interest was related on how the technology can actually influence people's lives um, for real, uh, how we can benefit from. And um, 
at Google, we met our second co-founder, um, Vitek, who is one of the best mathematicians in the region, and we started discussing Wojtek's idea I mentioned during, uh, during the talk related to um, quantum physics and fitting hard problems uh, into quantum systems. And then we decided that once this is a time uh, and we see uh, the first systems we could test on are coming to the market, we'll just leave whatever corporation will be working for uh, to set up a bait. And um, it luckily happened. And uh, one more uh, thing I wanted to share with you is the fact that um, both Vitek and Wojtek started with optimization for logistics. And we had the pleasure to work with Ocado Technology from the UK and, and um, solve some optimization problems for them. And I was like constantly telling them that I really want to go to track discovery. I really want to do something of value. Like not only transportation is important and I don't claim uh, the other thing and it's green and whatever, like all of the optimizations we can have there, but I really wanted to um, deliver something we could be proud of as the, the, as the whole industry and bring new medicine or whatever sooner, sooner than it will happen without our technology. So here we are. <laughs> <laughs> and Mathilde? Yes, so for me, um, I did my, my PhD with ST Microelectronics, the CLAT, and uh, the University of Aix Marseille. And uh, I worked on uh, material sciences and uh, nanosciences, uh, so really focused on CMOS technology. But uh, in the uh, Grenoble environment, uh, it's really dynamic also in terms of uh, quantum science. And after my PhD, uh, I moved to the Netherlands where I joined QTech. Uh, there I was doing uh, nanofabrication and design as an engineer mm -hmm. um, on uh, quantum topological qubits, so with um, a joint program uh, between Microsoft and QTech. Uh, and this is where I started to work uh, for material science but applied to quantum physics. Uh, and then I got hired by QFOX uh, as a lead uh, for device integration. And uh, it's really a field that uh, uh, really interesting for me. Uh, I really enjoyed this conference too because uh, I'm working more on uh, material science and hardware, but it's nice to see all the applications that are possible uh, with uh, this technology. And it's really, uh, really interesting and promising. Thank you. Uh, Mathilde, you run uh, an association about uh, women in quantum. Uh, can you tell uh, a bit more about this? Yes. So uh, I'm also working as a voluntary uh, work uh, for uh, women in quantum development. So uh, it's called Wicked. Uh, and uh, it's an association uh, that wants to promote more uh, gender equity and for women, but also for uh, gender minorities. So we really have an intersectional approach for that. Mm -hmm. um, and our goal is to uh, connect women working in the field in the Netherlands. Uh, and retain women uh, in the field because um, if you if you look uh, maybe it's uh, for for a bit later but uh, I can start to can. to, <laughs> to <laughs> introduce the subject though there is a lack of women. It uh, was the next. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> can you feel that we have a lack of, of women in quantum actually? Because I see more than maybe in classical high tech at high level, but do you have a lack of talent? So uh, in STM in general, there are less women. Uh, I think in the Netherlands, uh, you have 27% uh, of uh, women that are a professor, but you have also a phenomenon that is called a leaky pipeline. So uh, if you have 50% of master uh, students that are uh, female, uh, then when you go to PhD student, it's 45%. And then to professor, it's even less. And I think in Europe, uh, in STM, we have 12% of women who are professors, for instance. Okay. Paina, I think uh, you, you struggle a bit to recruit. Uh, um, uh, why uh, do you see a syndrome in posture uh, for, for to, to, to recruit people uh, at the same level of men? Yeah, so um, I would uh, say we do not struggle with hiring. We have a lot of strong candidates, but I would say that 99% of these candidates are male. Um, and it, um, it is both related uh, to like technical, uh, deep technical positions, but also like 
for example, project manager roles. Uh, so it looks like um, the general overview of uh, quantum as the industry, uh, the perception uh, is this is something uh, really difficult, and you need to be an expert in quantum physics, at least with the PhD, at least, to stand any chance uh, to start. Um, and um, when, when we were uh, talking earlier, um, I had a situation uh, at Bait uh, where I um, posted a job posting for uh, the administration uh, specialist. And I had several uh, female PhDs in physics uh, applying for the job. So I asked them, uh, since you have the background, how about if we hire you for technical positions? And none of them uh, agreed. They told me, we're not good enough. Uh, this is too early. Um, so even though we're trying to explain that this is not, and we will uh, introduce them and train them, um, it didn't work. So, so I strongly see the imposter syndrome uh, in here. Okay. Uh, what initiative or strategy do you believe are effective in encouraging more women uh, to enter and stay in, in this uh, quantum field and also to accept to a new challenge and don't be afraid of uh, not lack of talent, but uh, that, that can learn? I think we can see at around this table, you have few have PhD, but we are others that don't have and have uh, this position. And finally, it's more a challenge to accept to be more open-minded, to, 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 to continue to learn, but it's not, uh, it's not a barrier, finally, maybe. Yeah, I, I would say that uh, we could spend like hours answering these questions. <laughs> there are so many levels we, we would need but to analyze. Do you have to fa analyze. find maybe one or two? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, but... Uh, Starting from uh, like raising kids, one of my friends uh, who used to be an engineer at Google, uh, after his second um, girl was born, he was like, I don't get it. Uh, all of the people um, uh, talking to uh, my friends, kids who are male, are telling them how smart you are, how brave it was, and whatever. While when they talk to my uh, girls, they are like, how pretty you are, how well you behave. So this is the basic problem. And I think we st st should start uh, right from there. But then we also need, as, um, as the industry, explain uh, that, of course, we need scientists. We need people um, coming from deep tech, understanding quantum, etc. But in order to work for the industry, you don't need to be an expert. And, and from our uh, perspective, if uh, you know uh, like um, algorithms, classical algorithms, uh, if you know like basic stuff in algebra, then it's good enough uh, to start. And, and we need to, to start changing this perception, telling about it like loudly and, and, and using uh, like organizations like this to, uh, to reach out to this female. Hmm. Do you want to comment? Uh, yes, I think I, I definitely agree. Uh, but I think also in terms of the strategies, I, I, I think there's, um, I think one of the stats I read was 80% uh, of quantum startups uh, do not have uh, female and senior positions. And I can really testify that this is definitely uh, a strong strategy to, to have. And I see it uh, at Algorithmic with having 50% um, of our C-suite as female and having a, um, our CEO as a professor of quantum physics, but also CEO of, of a startup. It really helps to attract women at the a high level. And I, I think, and we're quite proud, at, at, and I will say some of the stats at Algorithmic, we do have 30% of our uh, research uh, are, are held by uh, women, uh, with 27% of those women have PhDs. Uh, so it's, I think, if you, s if, and we can see, it, I mean, I've seen a shift really, uh, when you have more women in senior positions, you will have more applicants uh, as, senior, as, as women, because they are, they feel more comfortable that they can join a, a startup that will um, consider some of the needs, uh, because let's be honest, startup is not uh, conducive to a, a very easy environment for uh, women that have children. Uh, and then another technique that we have to keep those women, once we do have them, is to really, I mean, we're still small, we're 40 of us, and I think there is value in really taking, we still, we still can do this at a case-by-case at -case basis when we do these hackathons in Finland, 
uh, when we travel, uh, we really take care of, of, of the women to make sure that, you know, can they bring the children in case by case, we listen to what they, they need and we provide this because we ha absolutely have to hold on to, to, to those brilliant uh, minds. And, and I, I think this, this should, should be the same for not just women, also mm. men. Like, what are the needs? Because there's a lot of men out there that are, yeah. uh, you know, looking after kids. And so we, we really try to... Uh, we can do this now, we're 40. I don't know, we will have to put some policies in place as we scale, uh, but this is something that I think is, is ex been extremely powerful for us at Algorithmic. Nicole? But also um, what uh, both Mathilde and Paulina said, it starts very early, and if I think about like my career, how, how I went to be at, at some point uh, in, in a technical profession, like from the beginning, from very early on, up till when you actually work and go to interviews, ev at every stage of the way, you are told in one way or another that this is not for you, this is not your place. This is, you cannot do this, you're not good enough. When someone comes and says, I don't want to take the job because I'm not good enough, it is because they were told all their life that they're not good enough for this. And I remember like from the early ages, yes, uh, like, uh, um, no, this is not maths and so on, it's not for you, um, and you should maybe have some kids later when you're like, you know, when, you're, when you grow up, up to the point where um, um, professional advisors come to the school and tell you, no, you are interested in chemistry, you should not study chemistry because um, if you have kids, then um, you will be out of the job for too long, up to interviews where you are asked, for example, the kids question comes up, but also uh, other things like I was told in an interview after I did my PhD, um, you can, the first thing you can do is clean the labs because that's what women are good in. So we are told <laughs> at every step, and I remember like every phase of my life, um, um, encountering in one way or another, for example, also coming to conferences and some people just ignoring you, not wanting to talk to you, that this is a thing that, that is with us all our lives, every day. And sometimes we complain and then I, I understand when someone says, oh, it's a little thing you're complaining about now. Yes, but no, it's like the little needles that come every day. Sometimes it's bigger things that we can't go across, but we go through this like on a, on a daily basis. And, and it's very hard to understand if you haven't lived that, um, but it's a reality. Do you have uh, struggle or have to manage uh, trouble in your career to, 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 to improve yourself and yeah. have this position? I, I completely resonate with what you're saying. Um, I think, but I'm going to say something quite different actually. Um, and, and I think that one of the uh, things that resonated early on in my career, uh, I used to work at GlaxoSmithKline, Smith at GSK, and of course uh, we had, and I still have, a CEO that is wom a woman, Emma Wormsley. And I remember she said uh, something which has resonated with me all my, uh, for the rest of my career. And she said, you know, I often have a lot of interviews with, with journalists, and they always ask me, what is it like to be a woman in business? And actually she uh, said, you know, I always rephrase the journalist question to be, can you please ask it as, what is it like to be a woman, uh, uh, sorry, a person in business? And I think for some reason that resonated with me because eventually that is the end goal, right? So we don't want to be doing any more women in quantum panel um, because uh, and, uh, and we will have to keep doing this until uh, this, this is solved. But the end goal is really to be a person in business. And I think, I don't know if it has uh, definitely helped me in my career and I, maybe it's just in the terms of behavior, I just see myself as a person in business, not really necessarily a woman. And, and, uh, but I do think we, we should, it doesn't mean, however, that we should ignore uh, what, you're, what are the facts. Uh, and also it has helped me, it might not help other people, but I think this is definitely an advice that I, I, I give to yourself as yeah. just a person in business. <laughs> I mean, it's not that, that I'm saying, I'm just no, like, no, this was an explanation of why <laughs> this is so difficult, why you find so little mm -hmm. women. Because I felt like giving up many, many times in, in my career. Like really, I wanted to just leave it all behind and do something where I don't have to deal with that. And, and when, we th when we ask ourselves, why are they not there? Then I think that's a big, that's yeah. a big issue. Yeah, I, I think we need to change the comportment of the others mm. about, about that and to be more careful about uh, don't say uh, you are a woman, you, uh, you have a problem with family or everything. Uh, I, I had that uh, at the beginning of my career and I had to kin say, uh, you are brilliant, but you'll kill your career. And uh, finally I quit and I create my own company and now I'm here and I'm quantum lead. And it's, uh, but it's a choice also, I think, to, to push the woman to, to ignore this and to be confident about what they can do, even if they have 
kids. It's uh, it's possible finally. But yes, it's really hard. And uh, but uh, it's possible. I think you have another story, Christian, about uh, when you raise money. Uh, maybe <laughs> it's it, it, it's interesting also to see the cohort. Yes. Um, yes, I, I have seen. Uh, I mean, this is uh, obviously per personal, but sometimes. Um, investors will offer you <laughs> coaching at the end of the session as opposed to the check. Uh, so this, is, this has happened uh, so sometimes, but really uh, in terms of fundraising, uh, so we, I'm part of a founding team of uh, All In, which is a uh, coordinated response in the UK for UK startups and scale-ups to bring more diversity and inclusion. And, um, and still to this date, um, it, it's, it's essentially a, a, a pledge that you can sign. We have over 100 companies now uh, that monitor their, their diversity metrics. Uh, and also we have a community, and it's become so big now that we have sponsors, uh, mostly actually VCs, uh, to, in order for us to hire someone to take this to the next stage. And really our, our aim is to basically not exist anymore. Um, and one of the topics that still comes and resonates the most still to this date is fundraising for women. And actually we did a, a, um, a, an event in, in November um, and we always do surveys. Uh, and it's true that when you look at the data, it still says, of course, this was a woman in, in, in fundraising events. So you're obviously going to expect this kind of result. But really, when you ask the respondents of uh, over 100 people at the, at the event, you know, what is their fundraising journey? 100% of people, and 100% of, of female founders will tell you that they've had some sort of gender f uh, f form bias in their uh, fundraising process. And 88% uh, will say that often they would like that the, um, the, s the investment side uh, changes. And I think that this is possibly one of the areas uh, where we really need to, to focus on is, uh, I think the latest stat that, that I saw is 15% of the decision-making positions in uh, the investment world for funds that are above 50 million, uh, on, uh, 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 only 15% of those are held by women. Uh, so perha perhaps this is, is an area that is important. However, I am, <laughs> I am an optimist, and I actually uh, have seen some encouraging stats that came out this week from the latest pitch book, uh, Diversity Survey, which shows that actually the um, um, percentage of the, of, the, of the shares that uh, women female founders uh, are taking from the investment uh, pie in terms of deal and value has more, uh, you know, doubled faster than the men counterpart with I think 25% in uh, the value, um, in the investment deal count and then 20% for the value, uh, uh, which is a 5% increase on last year. So, so it is changing and I'm extremely positive that it's uh, going to be uh, improved in yeah. the future. Uh, if I may comment yeah, on this, sure. because uh, we mm. uh, faced some issues related to the public funding. And uh, I had a pleasure to um, talk uh, to uh, Commissioner Maria Gabriel when she was responsible for this part uh, in the European Union before uh, moving to uh, Bargellian government. Uh, and we created um, European Female Founders Forum because of uh, uh, this problem, not only with raising money, but uh, in general with diversity. And um, only then I learned uh, that there is so huge problem, uh, like diversity problem, when it comes to, uh, to the EU grants. And uh, at the end, uh, they even introduced something which shouldn't have happened, like if, if all was well, right, from the beginning, uh, that they wanted to have 40% of the startups at the final stage led by female, despite that fact we failed twice before. <laughs> but but uh, they noticed that the problem is there, that there is this huge discrepancy between um, female and male-led startups, despite uh, they offer um, mm -hmm. equally good technology. And of course, some are worse, some are better, but uh, but you will not be able to assess this after the first like application, right? Like short one. Yeah. If uh, I can comment on yeah, that, sure. So, um, so I think that basically the lack of women in quantum comes from the fact that there is an unconscious bias from the society, which makes that uh, people recruiting and at leading position tends to hire themselves. Um, Second point would be uh, that actually there is, there is a lack of appraisal. So uh, for the same CV between Jane and Joe or John, yeah. um, people will tend to hire uh, the men yeah. for exactly the same competencies. 
And uh, from what you said also, there is a, a lack of uh, role models. Um, by bringing more women in the field that can be role models, then uh, women and early gen like young generation of women uh, can represent themselves at a leading position and then feel that, okay, um, I have a representation and I can go for that. Maybe can I just add, so one of the things that I felt like when I'm asked like, how did you do it? How did you end up as in a technical position in, in, as a technical um, working in the tech field as a woman? Is when I, I never had a problem of finding a job, but in every job I had, I was told by the people who hired me, when you applied, you were like so high above everyone else. And that is fine. Okay, so they decided in the end then to take me, but that's not that's not the point the point is when you are the same or i think that in many cases what i feel a good female candidate and to have a mediocre male candidate often i feel the decision is for the mediocre male candidate and that's a problem i feel like really if if you are if you have something you bring something to the table that no one else has they will gladly take you as a woman, but um, if you are the same or even if you are better, you need to be much better than the male colleagues. That's what, what I feel, what I've seen also when other people apply, uh, not, not for myself, but when, when I, I see processes that, that I've seen that a lot of times. Mm. Okay. Uh, how do you think diversity, particularly, particularly gender diversity, contribute, contribute to progress in quantum computing research and development? Do you have an answer about that? What, what it can be changed if we have more women or more diversity in quantum also? Well, what, what you basically do if you do not let women in or block them on every stage, you, um, you, cut, your way, you cut yourself away from 50% of the potential. If, you have, if, if we have 50% if, if women roughly in the world and you do not consider them because you basically beat them down at every stage, this will be potential for your company that you will not have available. So th that's an easy, that's an e for me it's an easy answer. I don't, I don't understand why, uh, why there's a question mark about that. So for me it's like just that. It's not that we are better. We are also not better. We are maybe in some ways, at the moment I feel we are maybe uh, good at some areas where uh, men are not, but I, f I think this is a symptom of the same problem. If we are maybe able to mu multitask better or manage better because um, um, f um, women, for example, do more tasks in the household and manage that, then this is a symptom being better in these uh, tasks of actually a situation that is bad. So in an ideal world, everyone would really in all of the areas, multitasking, whatever, empathy, <laughs> be the same, be the same. but. Yeah, so, so I think in the end we want to uh, be a situation where it doesn't matter, so mm. it's not a better <laughs> thing. <laughs> yeah. Um, yeah. yeah, go ahead. Sorry. Uh, I would say that this is not only for quantum, like yeah. diverse teams are uh, better, perform better, get better results, have the bigger picture. Um, I often witnessed uh, situations where uh, my male engineering colleagues um, solved the problem, and they were happy. It's done, it's easy, uh, but it was not delivered. And uh, female felt like responsibility uh, to make this final step and to make the team work on the final solution and the delivery. So, uh, so they interact uh, with each other, and, and it's actually um, good for, uh, for the whole company, for products, for uh, for the quality of the products and for interactions with potential customers. Okay. Mathilde, do you want to more? Yeah, I wanted to emphasize the fact also that when you work in R&D, you want to bring innovative solutions. And if you are building a team, it's nice to have a diverse team because you don't want uh, three times the same person who will have the same idea. You want to have three persons who will have different ideas. Yeah. And this is what diversity brings. Different angle of view is mm. really constrictive. Uh, do you think men can help women and how uh, at uh, daily actually, uh, uh, and they need be involved more uh, in the changement? Uh, can you give them positive advice to have a constructive uh, change? Okay, I can I yeah. can go if yeah, you want. Uh, <laughs> yeah, so men have a huge role to play actually because uh, men can be good allies to women. 
Um, so men, if they want to help, they need to recognize that there is a problem and uh, that they can uh, participate to change uh, this issue. So they can read about the subject and uh, listen to women who are discussing about the subject. Uh, they can uh, like put into consideration that they have unconscious bias and they need to work on themselves to get uh, rid of this unconscious bias. Um, so it, they need to mobilize themselves to to get rid of the of the issue and to help women who are work working on the subject and expert of the su in the subject and to acknowledge that okay i can help them i can listen to them and i'm not no one is uh, is the center of the world so i'm not the center of the world and i can help people if i'm listening to them yeah from from my experience i can share the story uh with my co-founders who actually um they were like, okay, I'm a mathematician, I'm the physicist, and how will do the job, right? So, so they are uh, considering uh, their role as they are having fun, this is the playground, they of course have to deliver and work on important stuff, but this is fun for them, and now you can deal, and you need to deal with investors, you need to bring money, you need to talk to customers, you need to plan everything, etc. And they were like really supportive, uh, and they really... Um, see uh, that role uh, and female roles uh, in, uh, in our company as crucial and important and uh, their attitude towards um, us as female um, changes the whole atmosphere. So, so it builds you know, uh, this kind of attitude of inclusivity, uh, of support um, amongst the whole team. And I think that, uh, that this is important. I feel like it might sometimes not feel like much if there's like a team and there's one woman and it doesn't might not feel as a difference at first sight but there's a certain club that you build and uh, and you need to so for me it's more like um for be aware of the problems that you might have if you are someone who is different a woman in in a man's uh, can be a different uh, kind of um, diversity of, of course as well um, that it's not as easy to be part of the group, so it's not as easy to rise with the group, to interact with the group, and so be aware, be observant what happens, so what happens in communication, is that person talked over, is that, you know, is something said that is inappropriate or whatever, there can, it can be small things, can be larger things, and then speak up, because if we speak up as the people who are, um, 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 basically the, the, the target of, of maybe something that was said, it's very easy to dismiss us. If it's uncomfortable for everyone in the room, if it's uncomfortable for the, for the men in the group, then this is where we can start to change. Because we have been, like women have been saying that, that things are inappropriate for years and years and years. And it's not, that's not helping because we are dismissed too easily because already we've been, been treated um, that way. Okay. Uh, maybe a last question. Uh, what advice would you give to a young woman who wants to come in quantum uh, what, uh, and pursue a career? Um, I, I think, I mean, just be brave and embrace uncertainty <laughs> and, the, and on unknown because uh, that is, I think for me, it's an exciting thing. Like unknown and uncertainty is probably where I thrive and I do my best work actually, but it's not like that for everyone, but I really I in encourage people to just try it. And whenever you feel that there's uh, this feeling of fear is actually where you want to go because that's the um, sort of putting yourself out of your comfort zone is where the magic happens. Nicole? Um, yeah, so <laughs> I'm... I feel always a bit when I talk to, when I get that question, I, 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 there are two hearts beating in my chest because in a way I know how hard the way is. Mm -hmm. And in a way I know how um, resilient you have to be. Mm -hmm. And I always feel like I don't wish that on anyone, the pain that you have to go through. So, and I don't want to tell um, uh, young women, you have to be, you know, stubborn, resilient, and you have to, you know, push through even if it's very hard. Um, in, in the end, I feel like, and I hope, I mean, things are changing now. We see actually a lot of good things have happened in the last years from the bottom up, so from the uh, very young age. Um, uh, yeah, don't let yourself be discouraged if you feel that's what you can do, because not everyone has the energy to actually go there. 
to actually um, um, be be that kind of um, um, stubborn and resilient that you have to be. So um, follow, f yes, follow your heart. If this is what you have to do, do it, but be aware this will be a hard way for you. So this is, this is what I can say because I feel like I, I can't, I can't um, paint a picture of something that isn't reality. It's what, what, I, what I struggle with. I want more women and more young women to get into that, but um, I find it very hard to build up an illusion that, that isn't there. I would say come to bait. <laughs> because <laughs> then <laughs> if you uh, graduated from maths or physics and are not expert in quantum, we'll show you the path, we'll find the place. So yeah. And, and uh, just to be uh, super serious, um, I think that, that this is it. Like, um, if you are interested in uh, tech, don't be afraid of new technologies appearing. You don't need to be an expert from day one. Uh, you are capable of uh, learning the stuff. If myself not being, uh, like not having a uh, physical background, uh, I'm able to understand what my team is talking about. And of course, if they want, they will lose me uh, going like deeper and deeper. But what for, right? So, so if I'm able to speak their language and understand uh, what they are building, um, everyone can do it, especially people uh, coming from STEM. So, so just don't be afraid. Yeah. Maybe. Yeah, so in Wicked, what we, we are doing is to build a safe, a safe space where, like, these women who are isolated, like the only woman in one group or in one uh, uh, company sometimes even, uh, they can meet and network and uh, get uh, support and share the stories with other people. So I think uh, finding a safe space where you can actually uh, explain what you are living really helps. And... Uh, yeah, I think in the long run, uh, I'm really optimistic because um, so we are we are building modern technologies. So I think if we are building modern technologies, it has to come with a, a modern society and uh, more equity and uh, diversity, of course. Thank you. I just uh, would like to say uh, uh, I be confident. Uh, uh, just uh, go outside your comfort zone. Don't hesitate. It's sometimes hard, but finally uh, you learn a lot, and you learn also failed. And uh, after you are more strong, mm -hmm. uh, just to, to sometimes to have more bandage, <laughs> a bit time, but uh, and have time for this. But uh, yeah, no, if you are curious, if you are passionate. You are stronger and stronger, and we can write. We are on scene today and uh, and stage, and I can say we we are win uh, to to on on life, and it's nice to share this uh, experience. And uh, yeah, I I yeah. think now we are happy. It was hard <laughs> maybe, but we can say today we can be happy a bit. It's yeah. it can be better, but it's but as I said, like it's still it's still hard. I say it's well still hard. It's still hard. hard for I don't everyone. have. I personally don't have a problem with self-confidence. <laughs> <laughs> I really don't. And uh, but yeah. So uh, just be aware. I mean, follow your heart if that's what you want to do. But um, yeah. yeah, I say fe feel the fear and do it anyway. <laughs> yeah, yeah. It's uh, it's a good way. And look up for role models. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Thank you very much for your time. Uh, thank you, everyone. Thank you. And we are available to discuss if you have... Uh, so we do have some questions from uh, yeah, we have the questions. audience. Um, for the interest of time, I'll just pick one or two. So the first one is, do you guys think this problem is greater in quantum or it spans across different technical industry? I may start. Uh, <laughs> I think, yes, this is, this is my perspective uh, because I met a lot of female uh, being technical, uh, graduated PhDs, as I said. Uh, who consider quantum as something out of their reach, uh, something that is too difficult for them to understand, to learn, to work on. S it's so difficult that they will even not try. Um, while um, when I was working for Google on Motorola, we were running a lot of diversity programs um, for young female, for uh, female at um, the universities, trying to bring them towards uh, technology and working in technological companies. And it was easier, like everyone understands writing code, right? 
uh, but when other quantum appears, uh, then uh, the fear uh, is there, and I think that this is the barrier that many of them are afraid to pass. It, it could actually be really emerging technology, something new. Yes. Because that, that yes. problem of always being um, feeling like I'm not good enough for this, if you don't have the courage yes. to do the first steps, and then maybe after some time, I, I don't know, maybe it's something that uh, we have to look into how mm -hmm. it was in other areas. Maybe at first there were the, the women held back and then, then only later came in.